But that latter part is the vague gray area that is so connected to the individual. Um, and it connects with wisdom and a person's moral compass. So a while back, I asked a question and gave you my thoughts on, on the purpose of science itself um, and by extension the purpose of the university because of the the nature thereof that the that the um, university is the place where we train the next generation of scientists for the most part. The fun thing, of course, that I'm concerned about now is a different question, and I wanted to ask the question of the purpose of the scientist as opposed to the purpose of science, because I posit that they're not entirely the same thing. Um, and I'm going to wrap around to it um, at the end using my own story of why I am a scientist myself um, and what purpose I have, what drives me and keeps me going in the morning. Um, in the evening and when everything seems to be going wrong um, at times because there are days when it's that. But I wanted to start first like with a little reminder about telos, um, which Aristotle calls essentially purpose, intent, end, goal. And the inherent purpose is what he's kind of after, you know, ultimate purpose of something. For things, it's easy. It's a like a coffee mug, as they describe here. It's it's a container from which to drink hot beverages. Yeah, okay. Um, that reveals its purpose for a tree or something like that. You can define them without a religion, in reference to religion. Uh, Aristotle also said, like, tell us is what it was made for. Humans, Aristotle had a different take. For people, including scientists, of course, He's defined it as the purpose of humans is being happiness. Um, and the word he used here is uh, eudaimonia, which I am not pronouncing that right in the slightest probably, but that doesn't necessarily mean happy as in the emotion necessarily as much as fulfillment. Um, fulfillment, um, they refer to it here as excellence or refers to artistic, scientific, athletic, or any other kind of excellence Things that humans being human beings can do when they fulfill their potential, such as you're painting a picture, or winning a race, or writing philosophy. And this is an interesting thing here when we think about it, because it's not necessarily obvious, you know, here. So the purpose of the scientist is to do science, but science is a process at the same time. So... It can't just necessarily be to to do the whole time being science being processed. Well, of course, yes. When we talk about the idea of finding purpose with something, well, maybe maybe we also mean finding um, finding the idea of how do I put this? Well, the purpose of science, as we talked about it previously, was finding the truth, right? That's what you're seeking for. Purpose of science, purpose of the university is to find the truth. The purpose, though, of a scientist, then, is it also to find the truth? But then to what end? On top of it. Um, and it gets interesting because you want to be the one who finds the truth, but then to what end do you go to that final end purpose and things like that, where... You're more than just finding the truth all the time. Yes, we want to be passionate about finding the truth, but to what end? Um, and to that end, the purpose of a scientist is not necessarily only that. Um, and it gets back to the uniqueness of the individual human and what is their purpose. Um, what is it that they are doing when they fulfill their potential? Um... And that's where we want to get back to why would you even become a scientist? Because that's connected to the idea of purpose and fulfillment. And why would you stay as a scientist? You know, there's a lot of things there that um, connects to the idea of fulfillment. You're fulfilling some kind of purpose. You have a reason for becoming a scientist. Um, fulfilling some sort of deep need. I mean, you're... On the base level of just being a scientist, I would say your purpose is that your job is to find the truth. 
your purpose is to find the truth about something. Um, what that's inherently connected to, though, it may not be exactly what you think. Um, so this is a great um, piece from the American Scientist. Um, they actually republished it um, recently, and um, they published this article originally in 1986, as you're talking about, which is the 75th year of this particular organization. Um, and so 75 scientists in here offered their reasons for entering the field. And we're going to scroll through some of these, and then I'm going to give you my thoughts um, and tell a little bit of my story of why I became a scientist, and then hopefully wrap this all together in some coherent package that makes sense. So let's see. Oh, 2012 featured. Yeah, 100 reasons to become a scientist or an engineer. That's another one. But these are some old ones in here. Um, and then there's some very... There's some very interesting things with all this that I wanted to bring up. Um, so Thomas Lovejoy began with an utter, indeed, addictive fascination with other forms of life that led me through concern about what humanity is doing to the biology of the planet to consideration of ecosystems and global cycles that in turn has led to very practical concerns about how people should relate to nature. If the original fascination with jewel-like bits of natural science is always there. Um, and yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's a fair expression of one thing is just fascination for me. This is fascination in there is a lot of things. Heroes, Leonardo da Vinci, Charles Parsons, Ernest Rutherford for Rutherford in particular excited me because they were giants who straddled the present and the future and changed the world. They were also to some extent showmen. Parsons, a scientist engineer, couldn't persuade the Royal Navy to try out his turbines and ships knowing that if she lived, Queen Victoria would review the fleet at her Diamond Jubilee in 1897, Parsons researched high-speed hulls and propellers and built the Turbinia. He streaked around the startled fleet at 34 and a half knots, a then unimagined speed. From then on, not only the Royal Navy, but every other fleet switched to turbines. By 1907, the marine turbines of 70,000 horsepower powered the 38-knot liner Maritania. What could not lust after a life like that? Who could not lust after a life like that? Yeah, he was a mechanical engineer, but um, memories of childhood are unreliable. Evidence of an unfinished novel. Curiosity, Jane Goodall. Very good one here. You're just curious. To be perfectly honest, I don't see myself as a scientist. Not in the present day sense of the word, that is. I was shown while quite young that the world was so much more than just what we see and hear and sense. Science was shown to be a means through which we could go, could know and, <coughs> excuse me, have another great world that lies just beneath the surface of our everyday lives. Once I knew this, I knew I would learn to see as a scientist. In the days gone by, they used to call us natural philosophers. Now they call us just scientists. I always love to build things. And I, like I said, I'm just looking for some of, some of the more interesting ones here. I'm not going to read through all of these right now, but... Um, let's see. As an adolescent, I aspired to lasting fame. I craved factual certainty, and I thirsted for a meaningful vision of human life. So it became, this is like, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with that last part there, but I am tempted to tell a fine tale, noble and lyrical, but I guess I better repeat what I wrote last year in my book, The Civilized Engineer. Engineers from the little I knew studied science and used their brains. They also got jobs and earned salaries, and after fashion, they were cultural heroes. The newsreels that I saw every weekend became two movies, da, 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 and went to moon day, okay. Because I misunderstood a joke. That's a good reason why, right? <laughs> I am still aspiring to it. Being a scientist is less of a decision than a state of grace to be worked toward. You know, that's actually a pretty profound thing to think about, actually. Because it's just like, science itself is a process, not necessarily just a discipline that you go into. So, in a sense, you're ever refining with science. You're ever refining, ever pr producing more information, ever moving toward the truth by a series of proximal truths with every new study. You're still aspiring to it. You're still working to be a scientist always. Yes, perhaps. 
No idea what I wanted to do after high school, although I vaguely hoped it might involve fast cards and plenty of time for reading. Inspired by my chemistry teacher, rather than the, these foggy thoughts, I went to Sydney University and became a chemical engineer. I ended up with a PhD in theoretical physics and has the surprising realization that I could make a career out of solving puzzles trying to understand how the world works. Evelyn Hutchinson, yeah. My first remembered observation of an invertebrate was watching an omnicid walking around a glass top pillow box and wondering at its joint legs. Jointed legs. My father, a demonstrator in mineralogy, had given me the box with instructions where the animal was to be let out on in a flower bed when I was through my observations. So my mother gave me a preserving jar, a small but adequate aquarium for which I could captured a few scarlet water mites. Soon three spine sticklebacks occupied the large aquarium Poly oh my gosh, a polygyny of the small fish disturbed my mother. To me, this was just another occasion for asking why. They bred poorly in captivity in spite of their mammalian names, Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter, and, first, and the first three, I think, were female. To me, every aspect of nature was exemplified by my fascinating and strangely asymmetrical cordiax die, of which I am still writing. <laughs> I had always been fascinated by questions on how the mind worked. But becoming a scientist seemed to happen when I wasn't looking. All of a sudden, after some exposure to psychology, I found myself asking questions about the mind that seemed possible to answer, given some ingenuity. When I was a little girl, my mother showed me how to break open shale chips at fluorescent to find the delicate brown leaves that drifted into an ol oligocene lake. My father slowly walked with me up the mountain trails and showed me the wilderness. Later on, the summer I... The summer I was 18, I took my horse up a side canyon, and under the aspen, looked at, looking up at the maroon cliffs above Willow Creek, I decided I never wanted to be too far away from the beauty that my mother and father had first shown to me. Because there were two aspiring teachers, one undergraduate, one graduate, inspiring teachers, it would, who made it impossible to resist. Because from a young age, I had found great personal pleasure, and still do, in the aha experience that goes along with the success in solving problems. That's a, that's a fun one right there. Professor of Geology at Yale. Life by my mother, wise mother's prophecies needs true passion and cerebral odysseys. Science for me is part of that niche. Today, as you see, though, alas, I'm not rich. I'm passionately judging, hy juggling hypotheses. Oh, man, what a wonderful little uh, thing here. And I imagine she probably wanted us to pronounce rich instead of rich. But anyway, uh, or, well, it's niche, isn't it? Yeah, it's niche. It's niche, it's rich, it's hypotheses. Yep, 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 yep. I can't rhyme today. <laughs> Why? Why not? Indeed, how to avoid it? Science, I observed, licenses thinkering. Thinking and tinkering. <laughs> That's one way to think of it. I went into science because I hated it. <laughs> well, that's one way to think about it. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, I went into science because I absolutely hated it. Okay. <laughs> When I was eight years old, I looked up at the sky and stars and what the stars were made of. Later, I picked up rocks and admired them. Since I was 12 years old, I was wondering what made nature tick. I got a telescope from my father and read popular magazines on science, so I'm not unlike American scientists. I became a scientist to be a role model and teacher of science for black and other minority youth and to encourage them to believe in themselves and their creative potential to develop new knowledge and through research that contributes to providing food and health and a better environment for all. For as long as I could remember, I lived outside with the animals. Do, 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 do. There's a lot of it because I'm good at it. Yeah, well, maybe. Um, the reason I initially became a scientist was that I couldn't believe someone would actually pay me to spend the rest of my life being curious and expanding my mind. Once I arrived at graduate school, I soon realized that there was an acute shortage of scientists worrying about why volcanoes tend to congregate in the South Pacific to create a tropical paradise. It's a tough job, but someone has to do it. Yeah. Convinced that naturalists are born and not made. Possibly. I never wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be a mathematician for the sake of its consistency, which I found absent in every other endeavor. In the end, it was quantum physics and the uncertainty principle which converted me to science. Still later, the need for defense drew me from pure science into the turbulent activities of unexpected novel applications. What I wanted, I did not attain. What I got, I do not regret.
For generations and perhaps centuries, a worthy man's calling in my family was to become a scholar. Then my grandparents' 16th child fell in love with mathematics and ran off to Paris. When I turned 20, he decided that our family's old tr and new traditions and my gifts had written for me a mathematician's life. But some inner pressure I could never analyze properly made me flee all established topics. Tyranny had not broken my s but strengthened my spirit, and I reserved my passion to a mess of ill-fitting miscellanea, following a star that was without form and without name, but eventually gave me the privilege of revealing it revealing and naming it. Fractal geometry celebrates the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and natural science, and introduces the twin theme of the twin themes of the unreasonable plastic beauty of the shapes of mathematics. Conceptual beauty, practical usefulness, and pleasure to the eye brought together unexpectedly. The first may have satisfied my ancestors. There's so much in here that, you know, you really could spend all day thinking about these because these are some incredibly brilliant scientists here. A lot of them do say curiosity, and curiosity is one thing. I mean, you're satisfying curiosity and your fascination with science and you're finding the truth about something. That is the big thing. But I would submit that every scientist, to a degree, has that fascination, that curiosity about something that they just want to know more about, learn more about, and, and, and the, the how behind that and why you're that curious can change. But the curiosity is always there. And so to agree, the purpose of the scientist, yeah, is to find the truth, to satisfy that deep desire to fulfill your own curiosity but there is also more than that in in that um you can go on to fulfill other needs and other things or be interested in the world around you so some of these have written about the idea of wanting to protect and preserve the world or to serve the underserved communities in in that were around them at the time um, because again, this is 1986 that we're looking back on and these are people who lived long before then and probably through the civil rights period and all that. So there's a lot of things in there. So bear that in mind as you're reading some of these, but why did you become, well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking 30 years and aren't enough time for a satisfactory answer. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. I mean, sometimes you don't even know why you've become a scientist. I became a scientist by a winding path. Among early influences were the following. Curiosities of nature, such as animals in the zoo and dinosaur skeletons in museums, puzzling technological devices like the siphon in Prohibition times, and the electric motor. Books portraying scientists as heroes like Paul de Kroof's Microbe Hunters, and exposure to mathematics, my most striking memory being Euler's formula, or Euler's formula. Popular books like Bernard Jaff's Crucibles of Chemistry, which often wonderful offered wonderful overviews of natural phenomena. The desire for a great overview led me to graduate work in philosophy. While working on a dissertation concerning inductive probability, however, I was led back to physics, which, all, which uses probability and profound explanations of phenomena. The consequence has been a profession combining philosophy and physics in a way that can be characterized by the old-fashioned term natural philosophy. There's so much good stuff in here. I, I could just all this today um it could be really really fascinating here so it's it's decidedly wonderful i was told that an exceptionally curious but ill-mannered little boy it was world war ii that got me interested in physics so i mean serving serving the world around you um with that one bombs would continue to move forward and they fell yeah There's so much good stuff in here that it's it's really hard for me to dwell on any one thing, but there's some consistent themes looking at many of these old and very famous um, figures in science. Uh, men, women, um, multiple different races in here. Um, I became a field biologist out of love for animals and a preference for the quiet life of the in the wilderness. The animals I have observed, such as tiger, mountain gorilla, and giant panda, not only satisfied a sense of wonder by their beauty and elegance, but also they enabled me to become an explorer both in the intellectual and physical realms. At first I studied animals out of curiosity and for pleasure, but noting with, the dismay, with dismay the exponential destruction of wildlife, I now strive for an ideal beyond science. I help fight for the future of all species. So, I think that's actually a good point. 
to start bringing in my own thoughts on, on my own journey so far as being a scientist and the purpose that I have behind it. The, the interesting thing with this is that I think all scientists start their journey somewhere with some nugget of curiosity or fascination or just cheerful glee. For me as a kid, it was, <laughs> sometimes to the consternation of my parents, running outside in the middle of thunderstorms and hurricanes when I was growing up. Um, because, you know, it, it was just so much damn fun being terrified at first as a kid, but then be like, oh my God, that's so cool. And admittedly, I still am. I mean, I just, I just took some awesome footage of thunderstorms here where I am right now. Um, and it's going to be that kind of fascination that sparks the curiosity. You want to know more. You want to understand it. You want to do more work with it. You want to expand knowledge of it. And that's where you start. But that isn't necessarily where you stop. In a way, for a lot of scientists, I think it is part, it is where you start the journey to find your purpose of being a scientist. And remember, just the generic scientist, you're after the truth. I mean, you want to know why. You want to know the truth, the objective reality behind this thing that you are so fascinated about. And so that's that that curiosity, that desire for the objective truth is always there. But herein lies the next thing, and he points it out lightly, Mr. Uh, Dr. Schaller here, at the end points it out nicely, that it can go beyond that. That your purpose for being a scientist is revealed more as you go through life. Um, for me... I distinctly recall um, when I was working on my bachelor's degree in meteorology, uh, my sophomore year was 2005-2006. So in August 2005, as I was starting my sophomore year, was when Hurricane Katrina made landfall um, in New Orleans, well, around New Orleans, and to devastating effect for that area. The city of New Orleans was flooded. Much of the surrounding parishes were flooded. Um, and it was tremendously devastating. Um, and it remains to this day when adjusted for inflation, tide is the costliest hurricane in U.S. history. Um, alongside Hurricane Harvey, actually. Um, yeah, because they, they, when they adjusted for inflation, they came out to be about the same. Um, and one of the deadliest. Katrina was one of the deadliest hurricanes in U.S. history. Um, in February, uh, in March of 2006, after, during their spring break, I went down to Louisiana on a service trip to help um, families and people affected by the hurricane. And this was six months later. Um, and when you're there seeing what happens, um, when you're there watching... When you're just watching from afar, you you know where you're learning the physics, right, from a classroom. You're not seeing necessarily what those physics mean to other people and how, how detrimental or devastating that can be. Um, but going there is... It, it, it really helps you realize and connect physical phenomena to what does it mean for the world around you. And for me in my life, when I look back on it um, all the time, that's when a lot of things changed for me in terms of why did I want this career so badly? Yes, I was absolutely fascinated. Still am. Love it. I have so much fun. Every time there's a storm that comes by, I'm just a nerdy little geek with storms. Um, myself and just have so much fun, but wanting more so than not just to be fascinated by it, be excited by it, be curious about it, wanting to learn more, understand more, but now then also wanting to learn more to then help others. And it was a winding path for me to end up where I am in climate because I started working in, in, in a particular climate center after that and then, you know, got got off onto uh, where I am now as a PhD climate scientist. And I still look back on that day. Um, so for me, it's finding the truth and making sure I'm communicating the truth about what I research because it matters and it affects people. Every single day. Somewhere in the world. 
Um, and in the case of climate, it's all the time, um, though it's not necessarily obvious to, to people who are dealing with the climate that it happens all the time. And it's affecting them all the time. Because you're living in it all the time, you're not necessarily aware, and you're not necessarily thinking about the fact that, oh, hey, climate here in this area. Um, but it does affect you all the time. And so for me, finding the truth then becomes remarkably important. And communicating that truth, communicating the truth effectively. I'm not going to use the stupid your truth, my truth thing because to me I'm sorry that's that's annoying it's your experience my experience or your life my life kind of thing that your truth doesn't make any sense to me it's an oxymoron um but yeah that's that's a lot of it, it's hard for me to put it into words for myself um but it's about finding the truth for me about something that I am really passionate about and learning a lot about I love 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 seeing so many different places and when I travel I'm thinking about how the climate affects this different place and that different place and what have you and you know what kind of what does it do to vegetation and what kind of crops can be grown there that's all connected with the climate so that's the thing kind of things that I'm thinking about all the time um and it just matters to me because there's the people who live in that in those areas in that climate all people regardless of whatever you know immutable characteristics or anything like that um, it affects you in some way. And so it's important to me, particularly as we're modeling the climate now, because a lot of what I focus on is climate modeling, is making sure we're doing our damnedest because we are talking about something that affects so many. So I get passionate about finding the truth and making sure that shit is done right in the climate modeling field and in downscaling and what have you because it affects people. And in a lot of ways, it can affect people in very devastating ways. Um, at least in terms of the weather. But the weather is connected to the climate in that. The weather is in, in you know, the frequency of weather events is a climate thing. Um, there's a whole thing we can talk about it, the difference with other climate. Go back to the Epic Times Review article. I'm sorry, the review of the Epic Times article, if you want me to talk about that. Because I talked about the difference between weather and climate. Anyway. The thing there, it's... That, that's a big thing about why I get so passionate about the truth and in a lot of ways that particular event in my life is why I don't spend as much time with academics I don't think anymore because I, I did I saw an interesting interview with um, Ishred Manji um, earlier today and she she went off and made a very good point that you know People outside of academia, and again, there's, I don't know how many published studies there are, so this is going a little bit off of anecdotal and my own experience plus what I'm seeing with others. People of outside of academia don't think people in academia think of them very favorably. Um, and people in academia tend to make a lot of assumptions about the intellect, the moral character, um, and a whole bunch of other things for people outside of academia. It's been my observation. Um, and sometimes it's, sometimes it feels like I'm a mutual punching bag, um, thinking about this and trying to remind people this and people don't seem to be listening, but, um, that's a whole other thing. But, so that's why it matters to me. It's not necessarily the academics. I don't, I don't honestly care about being famous. I care about what does all this stuff that I'm doing, all this stuff that I'm studying mean for people, and how can people best use the information that I produce? Um, and, you know, make sure they use it in a way that's not, that, that it's, that it's meant for, you know, um, some things climate model projections can do and some things they can't do. You shouldn't use it for what you shouldn't use it to do something that it cannot do. It cannot, if it can't provide you a projection of something, you shouldn't use it to do that. You're shooting yourself in the foot. And that's the kind of things where I get passionate about it and the truth. And I'm going to tell you if I think it's what you did with that climate model projection is shitty or not. I'm going to say it. I'm going to be more polite than that, but I, I'm going to say it. Um, 
And it's funny because, you know, I, I guess I'll end on this. Like That's where I think about it for me, is that everybody is a scientist should be in pursuit of the truth. And their purpose is to be in pursuit of the truth always. To some end that is beneficial to the world around them. And to society around them. But that latter part is the vague gray area that is so connected to the individual. Um... And it connects with wisdom and a person's moral compass. Um, because as I said in another video on the difference between science and wisdom, science, no amount of science and scientific method gives you a moral compass. There's been a lot of things where science was bastardized to lead to some horrific ends. As I said, no, notably the case of Trofim Lysenko in the USSR that read, led to famine and to the executions of hundreds of scientists who disagreed with Lysenko. Um... Because Lysenko was a favorite of Stalin, and Lysenko's view was compatible with Marxism and all that. And there was a whole crap ton of people who died because of Lysenko putting ideology before the truth. Yes, you can have your purpose as being a scientist be something connected to bettering society. In fact, I would hope that's the reason you're being a scientist, and you're not doing it to destroy life and society on this planet. Um... If you are, we need to talk, because i got a problem with you. <laughs> but if your purpose then is also to do that, and you have a distinct love for this planet or for something that you're so curious about, or in my case, you know, for the benefit of people, then you should be utterly zealously passionate about finding the truth. And so, in general... I would say the purpose of a scientist is to find the truth. This is much the same as a university and science itself, finding the truth. But the added but the added bonus there in Aristotle's line of thinking of fulfillment in the human personal um, sense is you're finding the truth to the to the purpose of something else. You know. You're finding the truth to affect the purpose of something else. Um, my case, you know, in hopes that people use projections to make wise policy decisions um, or wise vulnerability assessments or wise impact assessments or wise adaptation decisions, any number of different things. Whatever you do with the projections, I hope you just use them right. Um, and I'm going to call you on it if you're using it wrong um, whenever I see it at this point. <clears throat> because that's what matters to me. Is If you're making decisions with the projections that, you know, that... that what I've done in research says, or what others, others have done in research says, is an incredibly bad idea. I'm going to tell you no. Um, that's not good. You're using it wrong. And, you know, if you're doing it right, I'm going to say, hey, <laughs> bravo. Um, but, yeah, whatever that extra end is beyond pursuing the truth, that is very deeply connected to the person. And to a person's moral compass. And I do think also that being careful about that, whatever that extra piece is that's so personal to you, the individual scientist, um, that that's actually really critical to be careful about because the ideology... The desire to have that particular aspect win out, that you want to see the world a certain way, that you think it should be this, that you think it should be that, that can be connected to whatever that extra purpose is for life. And I think in the realm of scientists where Lysenko... Lysenko might have started with good intentions. A lot of scientists might have started with good intentions. A lot of scientists have started with horrible intentions and straight from ideology and led to bastardized science. Um... But you end up with the notion then of if this extra thing that fully defines your purpose for being a scientist is more important to you, is, is so important to you that you are bent to achieve that part of it 
more so than finding the truth and maintaining your fascination and your love and respect for the thing you're studying, then that, I think, is where things can run really awry for a scientist, where you start ignoring your own biases and end up discussing and end up ignoring key bits of evidence or constructing a study in such a way that you get a outcome that you want because that's what you want to see because you think it will be beneficial and what have you. Um, and it will meet your other purpose of trying to make the world better or trying to save a species or trying to do this or trying to do that instead of acting, finding the truth and acting on that. You are avoiding the truth because you desire something to happen in a particular way or a particular answer to the question because then it fulfills your deep desire for this other thing over here. I'm, I'm not sure that I articulated that quite right, but I think that's where many scientists run the danger of going awry and stop. And they, at that point, they stop being scientists and are much more interested in being activists. A scientist should always be zealously in part of the pursuit of the truth. That's, this is, I'm almost there, I, I promise. The purpose of the scientist is to pursue the truth, and zealously so. With respect to whatever it is that gives you that zeal, be it the climate or what have you, and that zeal can be defined by something else. But that zeal shouldn't overwhelm the wisdom that comes from finding the truth. Not the wisdom, the knowledge of the truth, rather. Because remember, wisdom wisdom is not wisdom and knowledge are not the same thing. Um, you should always be in pursuit of the truth, but never, always zealously, but never let the zeal overcome that, overcome the truth. Let's put it that way. So if you find something in your zeal, you know, that that doesn't work for what you were zealously passionate about in changing the world and what have you, or how you think the world should be changed, you can't get away from that. You, you can't just say, well, that's not right because it doesn't meet what I want it to be. You as the scientist have to be honest to say to the world that this is what I found, that I'm sorry, it's not going to work the way we want it to. It doesn't say what we want it to. We need to do more research on this. We need to do more research on that. Maybe this other thing will work better to solve the problem. You can't just say, well, no, that study's not right, so we're going to go do it again somewhere else. You can't do that. That is that is abdicating your responsibility as a scientist. Because you are, and your primary purpose is to find the truth toward whatever end, for what you're most curious about, for what your your field is, but you cannot, well, if you do, go off in the direction of having what you think the world should be be more important, then you are most definitely, I think, driving the world toward bad things because you're not being honest and truthful, and particularly when scientists have such a prominent role in society and shaping policy now. I'll, I'll end on one extra note. Because most scientists don't ever go into this to become famous. And I actually count one of them. count myself among that. And, you know, after that trip to New Orleans and, and meeting Katrina, I was home in October of 2008, starting 2006, I should say, following my junior year. I was home uh, for fall break. I was an out-of-state student at the time. Um... And there was a letter waiting for me when I got home. And I opened up the letter and this was a little card. It was postmarked from Baton Rouge. And I was just like, who do I know in Baton Rouge? And I still have it around the house here somewhere. Um, but it was this thank you card from a family. And I don't ever forget it. Because, you know, it was just thank you for being a hero to us. For coming here and helping us. In all of the things that has happened since then. 
nothing has mattered more to me than those simple kinds of thank yous. To be honest. And, you know, since then I've earned three degrees and, you know, got a PhD and got awards for articles that I've written at this point. Um, and and talked in, in, in depth in hundreds of presentations. You know, multiple multiple, multiple publications with my name on it now. Um, you know, rising, rising, I'm still technically an early career scientist, but I'm rising, you know, and, and doing better and better and more and more each day and becoming more established. But for all the accolades and all the things, nothing has mattered more to me than that... One little thank you note from a family I have never met. To this day, I have never met that family. But I don't think they realize just how much that thank you note mattered to me. And if I ever meet them, God only knows I'll be as teary yet as I am now, if not more. And so... That's one of the reasons why, for me, it's about people. It's it's about what do I what am I doing contributing to help people with respect to understanding, helping them understand the climate, understand how we predict the climate, you know, improving how we predict predict and project climate and all the rest, improving our understanding on these different processes. And that kind of stuff, those little thank yous matter to me so much more than any of the accolades that I've received. Any of the things on my CV, they don't matter anywhere near as much as that simple little thank you card from 15 years ago. 15 years. Um, They don't matter anywhere near as much as that. Because it's just about helping people, you know? <laughs> Thank yous, like, from students that I mentored way back in the day. Um, still have those, by the way. Those are nice things to go back to every so often. But, you know, this is, like, you know how much it matters to me? It's like, my, my, my supervisor actually asked me, hey, can you, at some point, want you to put in a session proposal for a conference and what have you. And she said to me at one point, she's like, yeah, it's a great way to raise your name recognition and all this kind of stuff. And I walked away saying, yeah, I would do it. I didn't end up doing it because I just ran out of time. It was a super busy week. Um, so I'll do it next year for sure. But but I went, went walking and I thought to myself, self, I don't want the name recognition. I'm not doing a YouTube channel because I want the name recognition. I'm doing a YouTube to put my ideas out there. If you all agree, you all agree. Uh, and talk about issues going on in science and raise some issues. I don't honestly care about the name recognition. Um, I never have. Honestly, never have. And that's part of the reason, probably, why Subconscious didn't kick in to say, hey, you need to do, you need to write the session proposal, because I'm not going to do it for name recognition. I'm going to do it because it's an interesting, interesting thing to want to talk about. Interesting thing that we need to talk about as a group of scientists to start advancing knowledge off in a particular direction, you know? Um, that whole thing, with name recognition and accolades and what have you. Doesn't line up with my purpose. Doesn't help me serve people. And I guess, for me, that is the purpose of a scientist. Or at least as far as I would have you. The generic purpose for every scientist is the zealous pursuit of the truth. <sighs> yeah, the generic pursuit of every scientist is the zealous pursuit of the truth. But beyond that is what is it that makes you zealously pursuing the truth? And for me, it's serving people. And particularly serving people who, you know, I'll never meet, probably never meet any of them. But helping people understand that science and doing research on all those different things and making sure that whatever we damn well do with these projections... People use them well and wisely, not for what things that they are uh, that they cannot do. And so, yeah, that's what I would say to that: is that 
the, the pursuit of the truth is the purpose of the scientist, zealously so. But whatever you are as an individual scientist and you happen to be watching this, you know, why do you zealously pursue the truth? Because that's the other part of your purpose of being a scientist. So that's all I got to say on this. I apologize for getting a tidbit weepy, um, but this kind of stuff makes me emotional. <clears throat> anyway, uh, if you like this video, like, comment, share, subscribe, all that jazz. Uh, of course, if you want more interaction with me, head over and become a supporter of SciWorthy.Locals.com. SciWorthy.Locals.com. Bit longer today because I know I've been rambling for a little while, um, thinking on this very, but fairly deep topic um to get into but that's normal for me with philosophical things um probably some more short explainer videos are coming soon um alongside of uh, some more topic videos and of course i'll end up reviewing articles again like reviewing that cnn uh reviewing the study that is that prompted a cnn article the study is not all that great anyway i <laughs> hope you enjoyed um until next time this is adrian signing off i hope you all stay curious my friends